going on everyone hope you all had a wonderful holiday season and a great start to the new year so far uh you know starting off 2024 with a little banger here we're uh getting back in the swing of things gonna be starting to get videos out uh back on a regular basis again i put a uh channel update video out if you want to go check a look at that uh it's on in the channel talking about uh plans that i have moving forward with the channel for the near and far future etc cetera, etc cetera. but for now we're going to take a look here at uh, the scholar's lore as a video out on the founding of the gray knights uh he actually just pushed this out and uh i'm a big fan of the gray knights it's uh the chapter that i'm most interested in it would probably be my starting chapter for the tabletop so uh i saw this and said hey let's take a look at it see what it's about so uh, i will have a link to this video and the scholars lore channel down in the description below go check out their stuff they've got a lot of great warhammer 40k content uh so yeah go over there show them some love uh, if you like the content give them a like sub all that kind of stuff but for now we're gonna get on into this video here so like i said this is the scholar lore the scholars lore founding of the gray knights video check it out volumes gouda Amidst well, the dense ranks of the administration, <coughs> many adepts and scholars are locked in fervent debate over deciding which enemy stands as the greatest threat to humanity's precarious place within the galaxy. We are beset upon all sides by the invading swarms of extragalactic and ever-devouring tyrannids. The brutish orcs run rampant across every corner of the Imperium where they are driven purely by their innate compulsion towards committing acts of reckless violence. You know, I mean, as we're starting off this video here, he's talking about all the various enemies and whatnot, but I mean, from everything that I know so far, it really seems like the forces of chaos just are the essential, you know, opposites, antagonists, the main overall bad guy for humanity in the 40K universe. And I mean, really, it, like chaos can just kind of spring up out of out of anywhere really and that that's what the issue really is and it's a situation where once the the seed of corruption starts it's it's pretty much almost impossible to really get rid of it unless you purge you know potentially having to purge planets kind of situation so i mean just that fact alone really makes them such a great threat and even if you know soldiers that fight and kill these you know demonic entities and win battles against them they can even be corrupted themselves so even if you win a battle you still kind of lose and no matter what you know you do no matter how many demons you know beings of the chaos whatever that you kill they just go back and reform in the warp and just keep coming at you so it's like a never-ending you know battle against the forces of chaos you know, those facts alone really just make them the most dangerous threat, in my opinion. You know, you can you can actually, like, kill Tyranids and, and wipe them out. Granted, their, their numbers are potentially, you know, we don't even know because we don't even know if we've seen the full force of the Tyranids yet. And, you know, the Orcs, you can actually, you know, kill them and wipe them out as well. And Eldar, like, all the other races, you can actually, like diminish their numbers and push them back and do things that actually like equate to a real victory whereas with with chaos there's kind of almost not really a, a victory you know when you fight them it's, it's it's a situation where you know like i said even when you win you kind of lose so that fa I, I just that fact alone just makes them just the most dangerous it, it really seems like from what i've learned so far the only real victory you can have over uh the the denizens of the the warp the chaos demons chaos gods etc is if peace were to reign in the material plane you know and because what happens in the material plane affects what happens in the warp so to diminish their powers you have to essentially change how the material plane exists and you have to forge alliances and peace treaties with these other races and stop fighting and obviously that's not really in the cards. So, anyway, let's continue. Innate <clears throat> compulsion towards committing acts of reckless violence. Ancient Eldari vessels drift through the cosmic web to 
cruelly remind us of the bygone days of their once mighty stellar empire. Meanwhile, the decrepit living metal constructs of the Necrons have awoken from their eons of slumber with the sole intent of purging all biological life which stands before them. See, and then the other thing too, like, there are instances where you, where people can work together with some of these other races. There are instances where you might have to work with the Tyranids or the the Necrons or whatever, again, or not the Tyranids, the Eldar. You might have to work with the Eldar and the Necrons against like the Tyranids or Chaos Demons and all these other things. There's instances where temporary alliances can be formed with some of these other races, whereas with the Chaos, you know, that just doesn't happen. You know, to make any kind of alliance or deal with Chaos is essentially you're just damning your soul, you know? So, like, that's another aspect of it. There's really no bargaining or or anything like that with the forces of chaos whereas with a lot of these other races there potentially can be there 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 are very small avenues but potentially avenues of coming to understanding with some of these other races because it's even happened in the past where humanity has had peace treaties and non-aggression pacts with the, the orcs and the eldars and stuff like that so i mean it's not unheard of to happen in the 40k universe but with chaos, that's just not a thing. <clears throat> Being metal constructs of the Necrons have awoken from their eons of slumber with the sole intent of purging all biological life which stands before them. But despite these looming threats, which are each poised to claim our galactic birthright, there is just one enemy which can claim the dark crown of being humanity's eternal nemesis well. and this most heinous of titles could only ever belong to the demonic forces of the warp. Since the dawn of humanity in our most humble of beginnings, we have been at odds with the scions of the dark gods who derive their strengths from our own emotional energies, which forever empower their nefarious legions. Perhaps more so than any other faction, it is the denizens of the warp who hold an unparalleled thirst for not only the destruction of our holy Imperium, but also for our very souls. All are susceptible to the insidious sway of chaos, whether it be the most ignorant and unassuming farmer toiling their life away upon an agri-world or a noble Astartes chapter master. None are safe from the gnawing yeah. whispers of demonic forces. Even in a pitched battle, the vast armies of the Imperium cannot truly stand against the unnatural and horrific entities which will viciously tear their way out of unreality. We are but mortals, raging against that which can never be truly killed. Our conflicts against the demon kin seem to only end at the fickle and capricious wills of the chaos gods themselves. Whilst we may struggle to replenish our staggering losses, they will exploit our own emotional outbursts to perpetually bolster their inexhaustible yep. ranks of demonic followers with new foul legions. Yeah, and I mean, that's just another facet of chaos is like, even from the chaos's perspective, any of their enemies are potential, you know, allies. They're they're just a number of creatures that they can potentially be turned, in you know, to to fight for them. They're they're being souls entities. You know, they can all be absorbed by the the chaos and turned and mutated and into and, and become, you know, allies to them. So I mean, and that's another thing you got to worry about when you're fighting them is, you know. Is the person next to me going to become corrupted? I, I could be sitting there, we could be fighting wave after wave of these demons off being successful, and then all of a sudden the guy next to me uh, succumbs to the corruption of the chaos and stabs me in the back. And, you know, he starts to mutate and go insane and yada yada. So it's like... It's just... It's, it's a damned if you do and damned if you don't situation. You have to fight them, obviously, but... It's just a difficult, it's just difficult. ranks you know? of demonic followers with new foul legions, all of whom seek nothing but to consume our sacred human essence. But there is hope in this dying light. 
Today, we are to investigate the greatest weapon against demonic forces which humanity has ever conceived, the Grey Knights. This is a mysterious brotherhood of champion Astartes who have but one singular purpose, and it is to banish the demon wherever it is to be encountered. Yeah, from what I understand, if the Grey Knights show up, you're basically just dead. Like, if there's been any kind of chaos corruption in an area that you've been at, and they show up, they expect it, you're done for, brother. ...is to banish the demon wherever it is to be encountered. Their genesis has been long shrouded beneath the veil of secrecy by imperial leaders. Few even know of their true existence, and many simply believe them to be a myth conjured up to embolden meager guardsmen who fear that which lurks in the mysterious darkness beyond our own reality. So that's kind of interesting that, you know, Astartes in general are, are almost kind of mythological, you know, beings, you know, of, of, of greater ability, etc. And then... Grey Knights, even above that, are even more so considered a myth, so... I just find that kind of interesting, you know, layers upon layers of... ...mythological, you know, what, whatever you want to call it, mythology. ...who fear that which lurks in the mysterious darkness beyond our own reality. However, the Grey Knights are undeniably real, and they transcend the concept of myth into the status of legend. Today, I shall attempt to elucidate upon their origins. Elucidate. Together that's, an, that's such an interesting word, elucidate. Today, I shall attempt to elucidate upon their origins, piecing together what scant records remain within the most hallowed depths of Terra's librariums. Unfortunately, Sorted historical events have been intentionally destroyed by the most senior of inquisitorial agents in the preceding millennia, all to prevent the organization's secrets from ever being revealed. Perhaps the only individual who truly knows of their first days would be the Grand Master of the Grey Knights himself. Mm. But nevertheless, I shall attempt to accurately recite the tale which has been lost to most. The creation of the Grey Knights has officially been accredited to having occurred during the Second Founding. However, its true inception began during the Bloody Day. The Second Founding, so I'm assuming... Is that... Uh, when, when would the Second Founding be? Uh, I'm not familiar with that term so far. Um, I assume that would obviously be after the Emperor's death, but like... Would it, would it be after the Emperor reunited everyone? Would, it, would their origins be like then? Because, I mean, like... From what I know of the timeline, there's... Because the, the, the founding wouldn't be considered... Humanity's origins going out before the Dark Age, you know, of technology happened before the Age of Strife, right? So I guess... Huh. Not sure, from what I know, what what the second founding would be considered. Um, cause the only thing I can think of is you know the age of uh, strife happened that split humanity into their separate worlds, and then the emperor you know conquered Terra and then respread out to the galaxy, reuniting everyone. That would be what I would know as I guess like the first refounding. Um. I don't know unless it's after they're talking about, you know, the, the Horus heresy happened. If the, any kind of fracturing and then reunification after that would be considered the second founding. And, you know, they're talking about how the formation of the Imperium is after that. You know, with the Emperor stuck on the Golden Throne and uh, essentially how the Imperium is now, basically. If they're considering that to be called the second founding, I guess let me know in the comments what 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 he's talking about with the second founding, because I'm I'm kind of drawing a blank on essentially what that could be from what I know so far. Second founding, 
However, its true inception began during the bloody days of the Horus heresy. At the time, the God Emperor still walked among us, but with his near prophetic and heartbreaking foresight, he knew that even if his forces were successful in quelling this rebellion, that the foul entities of the warp could never truly be vanquished and that they would eternally plague humanity throughout its future. He had watched his own sons fall to the ruinous powers. Mighty, true-born Astartes and even the demigod Primarchs were fallible to heretical temptation. Thus, he sought out to rectify his past mistakes by founding a group who could stare unflinchingly into the abyssal depths of the warp, only to stand resolute and unscathed by its infernal gaze. The first treacherous salvos of the war with the... You know, I wonder if during his creation of the Primarchs, that's what he tried to do, was make it so that they were going to be kind of... I mean, obviously had multiple plans for them, I would think, right? To go out and, you know, have the great crusade of spreading humanity and conquering the universe. But ultimately, I believe he knew that chaos was going to be the greatest threat to humanity. And combating chaos is going to be like the great eternal battle. And that's why he never told them about the warp, because he figured ign ignorance was bliss kind of a situation, etc., etc and trying to protect them that way, but I wonder if the scattering of the Primarchs, you know, when that happened, he wasn't able to necessarily potentially create them or raise them exactly how he wanted to, and maybe that was one of the things that he was trying to prepare the Primarchs for, was to bolster them against the warp and chaos, to kind of make them immune to corruption but because they were scattered he wasn't able to so like that was kind of his backup plan was to just not tell him about the warp and then you know had found the gray knights because you would think because every you know during the horus heresy time period and whatnot like every chapter has a primarch that is attached to them and you know the various space marines are based off of um their primarchs, you know, they were made from their primarchs DNA and their their traits, etc. The arch trait. So you would think that the Grey Knights, you know, would kind of be the same, right? They would be. They would have some kind of primarch who is, you know, a super psyker that is bolstered against the warp, and their stuff would be based off them. But I, I guess we'll find out here as we talk about the creation of them, you know gaze. The first treacherous salvos of the war with the arch traitor Horus had erupted upon Istvan III, and upon hearing of this most tragic of events, the Emperor turned to his most trusted friend and ally, Malkador the Sigilite. He was instructed to search for the most noble and dedicated servants to right. the Imperium who could embody his own vision for humanity's future by standing as the foundations to a new legion. The Emperor, currently preoccupied with completing his intricate plans for the Human Webway project, as well as by preparing for the looming conflict with Horus, gave Malkador his blessings, and the Sigilite embarked upon a far-flung journey throughout the stars. He visited the venerable homeworlds of each legion. He searched battlefields encased in the corpses of those who had fallen and delved into the deepest slums of the densest imperial hive cities, all in a relentless quest to interrogate loyalist, traitor and outcasted individuals alike. In a galaxy inhabited by trillions, he found but 12 men who were of strong enough character, skill mm. and unwavering... Only only 12, huh? Out of, out of trillions and trillions of people. Only 12 were selected to become the first Grey Knights. That's pretty crazy. They would have to be some very strong and unique people. And I mean, even out of Astartes, right? Like, yeah. 
found but 12 men who were of strong enough character, skill, and unwavering determination to stand before the emperor as his most loyal of champions. Among the chosen 12, four of these were imperial lords and administrative agents, while the remaining eight were mighty space marine heroes drawn from a variety of loyalist and traitor legions. These venerable warriors had cast aside their previous allegiances to pledge their remaining lives towards serving the emperor in what- So there were, there were even some that were part of the- I'm gonna back up here and listen to that again. There were even some that were part of the traitor legions that were selected? Hold up. ...and administrative agents, while the remaining eight were mighty space marine heroes drawn from a variety of loyalist and traitor legions. Okay, so... I guess technically traitor legions at that time, because this was during the Horus Heresy, doesn't necessarily mean that they were corrupted by chaos yet, correct? So, because... Obviously, if... When you come to think of the traitor legions, you're thinking of, you know... The legions that have been corrupted by chaos and have been turned, you know, the the word bearers and uh, the death death ward or death I don't know if it's death watch I forget what it's called the the Nurgle faction the Nurgle chaos brain faction and then there's the Zinch chaos brain faction but anyway so yeah when I think of traitor legions that's what I think of the the legions that have actually been turned by the the corruption of chaos. Um, so I would assume that this is before some of that happened, or some of these people, yeah, they hadn't been turned by the chaos corruption yet. I'm just trying to think of how that would work. Anyway, I guess let's just, let's just go on and, and continue this, but I find that pretty fascinating that even some, uh, some space marines from various trader legions were even selected, and made into Grey Knights, because... Because, <sighs> I mean, you, you think about it, like, the... Turning traitor, that's heresy, that's, you know, death. But... Obviously, that was overlooked. So, I guess there are some special circumstances where people can be redeemed in certain situations. I don't know. I, I, I guess that's... That's something of information that I would want to dive more into and learn more about. You know, if anyone has any more kind of information about circumstances like that or the specific people that were part of the Traitor Legions that were made into these Grey Knights and why they were given forgiveness and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, I would like to learn more about that. But anyway, so let, let's continue. These venerable warriors had cast aside their previous allegiances to pledge their remaining lives towards serving the Emperor in whatever capacity he required of them. This arduous search throughout the Imperium had been no small task for Malkador to complete, and so it was only in the final days of the heresy that he was finally able to return to Terra with his uncovered champions. His small void craft was able to silently slip through the various blockades erected across the Sol system, and soon enough he would faithfully serve his liege at his side once more. Some of the newly recruited champions were survivors of the harrowing Eisenstein atrocity, namely the Death Guard Captain Nathaniel Garrow and the erudite iterator Kyril Sinderman. Amongst the others was the defiant Thousand Sons Sergeant Revuel Arvida, later known as Janus, and the loyal, determined captain of the Lunar Wolves, Garviel Loken. These individuals had all proven themselves as being more than capable in their coming mission, as they had each served as members of Malkador's task force of the Knights Errant. This group had been tasked with performing certain clandestine actions to disrupt the schemes and plans of the traitor forces across the Imperium, all as a part of the Sigilites' silent war against the heretics. See, just listening to this stuff, th that just sounds like it would be a dope-ass TV show, man, or a movie or something. I, like, you think about that, like, 
Mal the you know Malkador goes around and he gathers these these this team of, of people up and then he sends them on various missions before they're Grey Knights to disrupt the traitors and and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. that would just that would be dope that would be dope I would love to watch that that would be awesome please let's let's start making shows off some of this shit all as a part of the Sigilites silent war against the heretics after making planet fall upon holy terror each of the selected members were quickly summoned to stand before the emperor within his palace during their initial meeting he assessed and analyzed their very being all to be sure that they could be worthy enough to carry out this precious task eventually he completed his survey and commended Malkador for having brought true champions to join in their cause. He ultimately saw them as being more than capable enough to enact his most crucial of plans, one which would be utterly essential for shielding humanity from the ephemeral and ever-shifting forces of the warp. The group was split off to attend to two distinct missions, the Four Lords were tasked with creating the framework of the Inquisition, an organization which would strive towards investigating and eliminating any traces of chaos were it to appear throughout the galaxy. The Marines, however, were taken with Malkador to the cold and distant moon of Titan, orbiting our own gaseous giant of Saturn. During the Sedulites' laborious search for his esteemed individuals, the Emperor had ordered the construction of a secluded fortress monastery upon Titan, hidden deep beneath its frigid and inhospitable surface. Such was the importance of this mission that none save the Emperor and his most trusted of advisors knew of its existence. Even the vast invasion fleets of the traitor forces did not suspect that such a grand structure had been erected within the far-flung moon. Interesting. But it held a truly treasured bounty of resources within. Upon their arrival, Malkador found a formidable army of servitors and loyal acolytes who would assist him in the challenges which lay ahead. The monastery was equipped with vast cryo vaults, each containing an immense stock of a unique and highly potent gene seed which was seen to express genetic traits which had never been previously encountered in any existing legion. In truth, this had been meticulously formulated using the Emperor's own genetic material, and it would serve as his parting gift to his new forces. Interesting. So he bases Gene Seed on himself to give to the Grey Knights. So wouldn't that make them like closer to the Emperor than almost anyone else? I mean, I guess other than the Primarchs themselves, right? Because they're based even more off his genetic material. That's pretty interesting. That's that, yeah, that's fascinating. And it would serve as his parting gift to his new forces, who would forever carry his legacy within their very bones. Thousands of capable recruits had also been sourced from across the Imperium by the order of the Emperor himself and they were destined to become the first-born members of his new legion. These initiates were plucked from Astartes' homeworlds, imperial regiments, and even from primitive worlds, where the inhabitants knew of nothing but labor and loyalty to the emperor. Their selection, however, was not done solely based on their physical prowess. You know, as I'm thinking about this, this is this is a complete tangent that my brain is just going off of right now. But if anyone has ever played Dragon Age Origin or the Dragon Age series, I wonder if the Grey Wardens were based off of kind of like the Grey Knights. Because if you think about it, the, the Grey Wardens and Dragon Age Origins are kind of a third party autonomous group that kind of works in secret. They have special, they're, they're, they don't get involved in politics and stuff. Their whole purpose is to hunt down and kill, you know, the arch dragons and the, the various, you know, demon entities and essentially to help 
you know, stave humanity off from any kind of, like, non-human invasion, essentially. Kind of like what the Grey Knights do. Um, and they go out and have certain people that go and, and recruit from the various cities and towns of people, and there's trials that they go through, and trials are very dangerous, and often, most of the time, people don't even survive the trials. So I wonder if, you know, it just... It's just a thought just that just popped into my brain, you know, as I'm sitting here watching this. The the Grey Wardens in Dragon Age Origin, they, they have very they have a lot of similarities. So I wonder if the developers at BioWare kind of based some of that off of, you know, the Warhammer 40k stuff here. ...was not done solely based on their physical prowess. Each aspirant possessed the gift of latent psychic ability and upon being imbued with the aforementioned gene seed, they would develop into potent and powerful psychers, possessing a level of mastery over their abilities in a way which had never been witnessed among their Astartes brethren. Hmm. Knowing of the importance of this mission and of the dire situation looming over terror, Malkador worked tirelessly to bring the Grey Knights into being. So, I mean... I wonder why have, I mean, because the, the, I'm just thinking that giving, you know, them extreme psyker abilities, I would think it would almost be like a double-edged sword. I mean, obviously it would bolster them from, you would want them to be as strong, you know, psychically as possible to um, fend themselves from, you know, demons and also battle the demons, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, there's also the, the, like, psychic mutes. I forget what they're called, but they're the, I, I think they're the sisters that work with the custodies, though, right? They're, like, psychic mutes or something like that, where they're, the like, the opposite of psychers. They, their genes and, and whatnot have been manipulated to where, like, they almost cancel out, like, psychic energies and stuff like that, you know? Uh, and they can drive, like, psychers insane kind of a situation so like wouldn't you want that i guess against the demons you know so but i don't know i'm just trying to think of the you know pros and cons of both but anyway let's just let's just continue my brain is kind of going off in various tangents malkador worked tirelessly to bring the gray knights into being he ordered the construction of new facilities and training grounds designed to pit the recruits against horrific trials which would prepare them for their oncoming battles. The initiates were forced to endure and overcome the harshest of challenges set against them, and despite the worrying volume of aspirant members who succumbed to these arduous tests, there were still some shining characters of brilliance who would soon take up their arms against the enemies of man. Whilst this training process seemed to be advancing rather well, fate, That's creepy. being ever an eternal and capricious mistress, intervened to disrupt their sacred plan. By this point, the traitor fleets had encroached close enough to holy terror that they would soon form an unbreakable blockade, and so the Emperor sent out a call for Malkador to return to his palace, a mission from which he would never return. As he departed, he selected the valiant knight Janus to take his place in overseeing the rest of this grand endeavor. Thus, Janus ascended from one of Malkador's chosen to become the first supreme grand master of the newly formed Grey Knights. As a final act of defiance against the traitor forces, Malkador initiated a ritual to further shroud Titan from the overwhelming scale of war which would soon drown the soul system. Whilst the fortress itself was heavily guarded and well hidden, he knew that the moon itself remained vulnerable. Throughout the galaxy, his psychic might was seconded by only the Emperor himself, and with these great powers... That alone's pretty crazy, that he's just supposed to be like a regular human, but... I guess there's even a theories that he's a perpetual too, that Malkador is a perpetual, along with the Emperor, and they may have been like, 
don't know that they were necessarily like raised together or grew up together, but yeah, he's like the only like real friend the emperor really has from what I understand and is like his most trusted person, but that's just kind of crazy that he's that powerful too, you know? His psychic might was seconded by only the emperor himself. And with these great powers, he initiated an ancient, long forgotten ritual as his parting gift to the burgeoning legion. He enveloped Titan within an expansive bubble of reality before plunging it deep into the warp itself, protected mm. from both the prying eyes of those who dwell within Interesting. and outside of our own plane of existence. Here, far removed from the turmoil of our galaxy, its inhabitants could dedicate their time towards completing their task with fervent determination and singular focus. Tragically, it was during the climactic hours of the Horus Heresy that Malkador finally yep. met his fated end. Yeah, he had to uh, take the seat on the Golden Throne while the Emperor dealt with Horus and it ended up destroying his soul. The Emperor was forced to remove himself from the Golden Throne in order to bring the Arch Traitor to justice. But this most sacred of seats could not be left empty. Knowing of the dire consequences, he asked the Sigilite to take his place upon the throne, where he would provide the psychic strength needed to shield the final vestiges of the human webway from falling to demonic forces. If these warp-born entities were allowed to breach the psychic barriers, then they could use the gateway to launch an all-out assault into the sanctified depths of the Imperial Palace, potentially no. leading to a traitor victory. Humanity would probably be destroyed. However, even with his immense psionic powers, we must remember that Malkador was but a mortal, and the monumental demands of this duty ultimately proved to be overwhelming. Following his calamitous but victorious duel with Horus, the crippled body of the Emperor was returned to the Imperial Palace, however a most harrowed sight was there to greet them. All that remained of Malkador the Sigilite was a withered and desiccated husk. His act of enduring the psychic storms had proved to be successful. However, as he sat, he appeared so frail and so hollow that none could be sure as to how his body was holding itself together. As he was carefully and gently removed from the golden throne, the great gift of life finally departed from his corporeal vessel and he fell to dust. That's a real good chat right there, bro. That's all I'm saying. Nakadoro was the man. With his death, his role within the Grey Knights came to an end, and the mantle of command rested solely on the shoulders of the Supreme Grand Master Janus. In the few short years which followed, Titan remained hidden within the warp, ever protected by the parting gift of Malkador's psychic might. Time is but a fickle thing within the Immaterium, so for the nascent Grey Knights, entire decades had seemingly come and gone, but during this period, they had seized time as a tremendous advantage. Grey Knights had their training arc, man. They, they went into the, the whatchamacallit in DBZ, the, uh, the, the time capsule thing, man. They just, they, they had their training arc. They went in there and got buff, you know what I'm saying? That's all that was. Malkador, like, threw them in there. But during this period, they had seized time as a tremendous advantage. As Titan silently reappeared within the orbit of Saturn, Janus had forged an incomparably potent weapon against the demonic hordes. The fortress monastery had disappeared with but eight Astartes and their recruits, but they emerged with a complete roster of 1,000 fully-fledged Grey Knights. Each of these sacred warriors were true masters of combat who could surpass even the veterans of the heresy in their martial abilities. I am. Regardless of these skills, however, their prowess in fighting against the forces of the warp had truly risen to a level without equal. The psychic chapter had meticulously honed their abilities to excel at banishing the demonic forces of the warp. The forbidden rituals and psionic techniques taught to them by the late hero Malkador 
would allow them to be unmatched paragons in the eternal quest of eradicating and purging the scions of the dark gods. Each of the Grey Knights will stride into battle, wielding potent force weapons, psi cannons and purgation flamers, all of which have been tuned and perfected towards the art of granting the touch of true death upon a foul demon. True death, so that mean there actually is a way to destroy them on like, I guess a psychic level? I guess that would make sense, you know, going back to my question of wanting them to be psychically, like, super powerful versus the like null psychic stuff you know the 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 people that have been like genetically modified to be like anti-psychic to where it you know you guys know what i'm talking about but you know because when the emperor fought horus he eventually not only killed him but he essentially destroyed his soul on a psychic level you know and just wiped him from reality so that the forces of chaos couldn't take his soul into the warp and corrupt him and make him some kind of greater demon or something like that you know so it would make sense that the gray knights i guess would be trained psychically and be powerful enough to wipe out on you know that kind of level beings of the warp you know demons of chaos and stuff like that I guess maybe some beings might be too powerful, some greater demons, and obviously, you know, chaos gods themselves, etc. Potentially might be beings that might be too powerful for them to be able to do that to, but it would make sense that some, like, normal lesser demons or whatever, that they'd be able to purge them from that. So, I guess that means they would be probably the greatest weapon against them if they're capable of doing such a thing, and if they have weapons tuned to being able to actually give them what they say here, true death so that's that's fascinating too okay okay towards the art of granting the touch of true death upon a foul demon aside from the astartes chapter the four human lords who were recruited by malkador had also completed their task of establishing the organization known as the inquisition and they had patiently awaited the foretold return of their knightly brothers Knowing the importance of keeping such a chapter obscured from the prying eyes of the galaxy, they quietly recorded their formation as having occurred during the chaotic and anarchic second founding as the 666th chapter of the Space Marines. Okay, I got you. They understood that most would never question their existence as being anything other than yet another successor chapter, and so their true origins were kept shrouded from the rest of the Imperium. Smart, the senior lords honestly. of the Inquisition embarked on a journey to Titan to meet with Janus and to discuss their newfound role within the galaxy as humanity's final bulwark against all things demonic. The words which transpired here are recorded only in the annals of the Grey Knights and were never to be disclosed to any but its own chapter's masters. They sealed a solemn pact which stated that both the Grey Knights and the Inquisition would ever be tied, and that their inaugural missions were to scour the galaxy of any lingering demonic remnants which persisted from the strife of the Horus heresy. The Grey Knights embarked on a shrouded crusade against the ever-present threat of the ruinous powers. Across a hundred worlds, hushed whispers emerged of resplendent, silver-armored angels manifesting from thin air to impale twisted crimson entities with their blazing spears of fury. Entire planets were purged of demonic forces by these mysterious knights, with their inhabitants being left in profound awe of the sheer majesty that I was bet. displayed. Kirill Sinderman one of the nobles who had pledged himself to Malkador had remained within his post as an inquisitor, standing ever vigilant to the threat of chaos across the Imperium. Despite his reverential role within the organization and his incomparable efforts in bringing both the Grey Knights and Inquisition into existence, he still could not escape from the oncoming times of darkness. During the middle of the 32nd millennium, Following the cataclysmic conflict known as the War of the Beast, Draken Vangorich, 
the Grand Master of the Officio Assassinorum, orchestrated a violent and bloody coup within the Imperium hmm. in a devastating event known as the Beheading. He swiftly executed his plan of eliminating each of the High Lords of Terror, as well as numerous hmm. high-ranking members of important institutions and organizations, with the Inquisition being a prime target for his ruthless purge. I wonder why that is. I, I, I think I've heard about this a little bit before, but thinking about it now, like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Hmm, I wonder what the reasonings were behind it. I believe he ends up getting caught and, and is, ended up killed as, you know, a traitor, but I'm wondering, I, I wonder what the reasonings are behind it, if it's some kind of, de you know, demonic corruption, or if it was a situation where... He thought they were abusing their, their powers, you know, and they weren't actually following the word of the Emperor or something like that. I'm, I'm curious. With the Inquisition being a prime target for his ruthless purge. As such, he poisoned Sindeman, condemning him to die in agony at the hands of someone who was meant to safeguard and protect the Imperium. With his dying breaths, he confided to a fellow Inquisitor that he was the final remaining member of Malkador's human recruits to know of the true founding story of the Grey Knights. Hmm. He revealed his instrumental efforts in mobilizing the Grey Knights to wage a relentless war against the demonic forces which remained within the galaxy in the aftermath of the Horus heresy. He also emphasized the profound significance of their mission in defending humanity from the foul and malevolent forces of the warp. Cinderman feared that the Grey Knights would simply be used as just another Astartes chapter, right. and that their true potential would be squandered by ignorant Imperial Lords, who remained oblivious to the existential threat posed by the ruinous powers. Yeah, right, that's true, because there's even then there's still only a certain amount of people that actually really know about the dangers of the warp and chaos and what they're really about. So it would be, yeah. Wow. I mean, just thinking about that as in the grander picture, the Grey Knights would be like a super duper ultra secret organization, you know, kind of, kind of situation then that, yeah, probably only a handful of people would know. I wonder how that really works in like the chain of command then when, when they actually get revealed, I guess only a few members of the inquisitor of the inquisition, some of the higher members in the inquisition probably know about them and know about their their mission and they i would assume the gray knights probably have free reign to do pretty much what they want to inside their charter of going out and killing demons you know and they probably only really answer to maybe some of the higher ups in the inquisition or work with some of the higher ups in the inquisition on certain missions and things to do stuff but that's interesting he imparted a task of vital importance to this Inquisitor and instructed her to depart to Titan, where she was to meet with the Supreme Grand Master Janus in order to formulate a new pact between the Grey Knights and the Inquisition. With Cinderman now deceased, she left for the Shrouded Moon and entered into a prolonged discourse with Janus as to the state of their chapter and the Imperium at large. They agreed that for the Grey Knights to fulfill their true purpose, that they must be more intimately tied towards the Inquisition, and that they should answer to none but the High Inquisitors themselves. There we go. I answered my As question. As such, the Inquisition... Which is pretty much what I thought. I would probably only answer to certain specific higher-ups in the Inquisition on certain things, but for the most part, they would have free reign, and they would probably... Only in certain probably dire circumstances would the Inquisition like kind of step in and say, hey, we need you to do this. And like maybe take command of certain missions, but it would probably be extremely rare. But the High Inquisitors themselves. As such, the Inquisition was divided into two distinct branches. The Ordo Xenos, who would focus on the alien threats of the right. galaxy. And then the demons. And the Ordo Malleus. Yeah. Who would solely turn their gaze to the threat of chaos. That I know. The key part of this agreement was that the Grey Knights should serve as the chamber militant 
of the Ordo Malleus, ensuring that they could be entirely dedicated to combating the machinations of the Dark Gods. With this agreement sealed, the Grey Knights assumed their intended role as the ultimate defenders of humanity mm. against the forces of the Immaterium. This psychic legion would only ever be deployed for missions where a demonic incursion was in full swing and where no other army could effectively combat the impending darkness. Shrouded in utmost secrecy, their near impossible task of containing and eliminating the powers of the warp falls only to them. They appear as a righteous storm, poised to banish the most foul of forces which exist only to bring about our downfall. The mere concept of chaos is a closely held secret within the Imperium. Most should never know of its existence, lest they tempt fate by attempting to corral and draw power from it. But for the Grey Knights, they only know of its truth too well. Each of its members stands as a valiant hero of light who will illuminate the darkest corners of our galaxy, shielding humanity from our own eternal enemy. There we go. There we go. Great video. Scholar's lore. Founding of the Grey Knights. 40k lore. Um, like I said earlier, the Grey Knights are the faction that I'm probably the most interested in overall. It, 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 it would be between them and the space, uh, the space wolves for who I'd want to play in the tabletop as far as the tabletop goes. But I feel, I, I don't know. I just, I'm very interested in their kind of you know secret holy mission as far as lore goes you know their their secret mission to hunt down and and destroy you know the the corruption of the the demons and the chaos demons uh i knew that uh as far as the founding of the gray knights went i knew that malachor or Mel I, I always like get his name like messed up i i i think it's malachor but i could be saying his name cor incorrectly but anyway the emperor's right hand man uh, I knew that he'd went out and selected unique people, but I didn't know that he had also sent them on specific missions um, beforehand. Like I said, man, I think that is the, uh, a basis for a what would be a badass like TV show, dude. Like, uh, could you imagine like a, a series like that in the Warhammer universe where like the first season could be, you know, Malachor going out and you know, going out on his mission to find these various people, recruit them, test them, etc., etc., get them together, and then start sending them out on very specific missions to test them and see if they're worthy, only to then bring them in front of the emperor to have them finally be selected, and then they start their their training as Grey Knights, you know, that could be like like the end of that part of the show, and then they could go into another show as them being Grey Knights, you know, etc., but that would be dope man that would be dope i could see that being you know an awesome show and uh if anyone you know sees this and uh decides to run with that just send him a check for the idea That's all i'm asking for just send him a check um but it also goes to show how powerful he was man the i didn't know at all that he shrouded titan in like a, a reality bubble and sent it into the warp and basically kind of Put them in like a time dilation situation where you know they could spend hundreds or potentially thousands of years you know in in the warp preparing and training for their great mission to defend humanity against the the forces of chaos but in the material you know materium uh reality you know only a short amount of time really had passed you know only a few years or something like that um and that just goes to show how powerful he was and to then say that he his power was only second like he's just a regular mortal and being that powerful let alone than the emperor that should also just give you an idea of how powerful the emperor was as, as a psychic being if you've got this regular i mean i say regular because he's just a mortal you know from these stories the i guess there's theories where he might be a perpetual but he essentially he's just immortal 
but to have the abilities like that and only have the emperor be your best and those psychic abilities that's pretty crazy man that's pretty crazy and and to show also that as powerful as he was the psychic storms destroyed him uh physically and psychically while the emperor was able to sit on the throne and you know control those things really with not much problem you know it really wasn't until um i forget who the primarch who knew of horus's turn and broke the psychic barriers trying to warn the emperor of what happened uh it's the 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 faction that ends up turning into the zinch chaos marines uh i forget the primarch's name i'm still trying to, to learn uh, you know all the names and all the various factions there's a lot of them out there um but yeah that's awesome 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 video um definitely always enjoy learning more about the gray knights um and one of my youtube members was very kind and he gave me a key to um uh warhammer 40k chaos gate you know the demon hunters which is essentially warhammer xcom where you're the gray knights so uh, I will definitely be playing through that at some point pretty soon. I'll probably do some streams of that and then, you know, re-upload the recordings. But we're uh, playing through some bolt gun right now. We're getting ready to, uh, I've got the, the first part of that uploaded. So if you want to check that out, you know, Warhammer 40k bolt gun, that's up there. And then uh, I'm going to be starting to do some of these reactions as some live streams. Uh, today is Monday the 1st, you know, we're starting off the new year. Uh, I think I'm probably going to try to start doing that on Wednesday and try to do like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule for doing some of those live streams for uh, members. Uh, there'll be, you know, member exclusive videos uh, or exclusive live streams where we can, uh, you know, have a pre you know, a pre little chat discussion and then uh, I'll do my reaction and then post reaction we'll have, you know, another discussion and, um, uh, yeah, so that'll be available for uh, uh, various members. So check out the member benefits if that's something you'd be interested in. But for now, that's going to do it for this video, guys. Very good video. Check out the Scholar's Lore. I'll have the link down below uh, to his channel and to this video in the description. And um, I appreciate you guys hanging out and watching the videos. Hope you had a wonderful holiday season. I hope the new year is treating you well so far. Thank you very much if you're still watching this video here to the very end. It, it means a lot very much means a lot if you like this video and my reaction consider leaving a like and a sub as it helps me and the channel grow and i greatly appreciate it and appreciate you guys spending the time to hang out so thank you guys very much have yourselves a wonderful day and i'll see you guys on the next one